Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everybody back. You had your coffee break, and uh, we'll pick right up where we left off in our last 30 minutes, and that'll be into Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. For those of you joining us on television, again, how we thank you for your letters. My goodness, the descriptive letters that we get of how you watch the program and how you make the coffee and how the dog gets excited, the canary gets excited. <laughs> <laughs> we get all these descriptions of people watching our program, but the main thing is they're learning, and that's all we can ask. And, uh, you know, we just got back from a long trip, and uh, the same every place we go. I watch you every morning. Well, when they watch every day then that tells me they're interested. If they just watch now and then, uh, they're just filling in time. So uh, for those of you out there, again, we just appreciate you so much for your prayers, your financial help, and of course your letters. Okay, back into Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and at that time, in other words, we're dealing with this final seven years. At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince who standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Now, I'm glad we looked at those two portions back in uh, Jeremiah and Zechariah in the last half hour, how a time of trouble it is indeed going to be for the nation of Israel, and it'll be such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. All right, now before we go look up and see what the Lord Jesus himself said about, turn back with me to Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. And while you're doing that, I'm going to put a, uh, a makeshift shortened up timeline on the board. I'll put it over here, hopefully, where you can get it on the camera. And you remember that we've coming up out of the Old Testament with all of these prophecies concerning all this. And, of course, it led up to his rejection after three years. And then according to all these Old Testament prophecies, see, that's what I have to constantly remind when I use this timeline. This is the Old Testament timeline. Then Christ would ascend back to glory according to Psalms 110, Verse 1, where it says, Come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Well, you see, shortly after that, these seven years were supposed to open up, divided by half, three and a half, and three and a half. And then that would trigger the second coming. Now, you see, when you look at it in this light, you have to ask the question then, so far as we're concerned, what's missing? Well, the church age, see? This calling out of the Gentile. Well, why? Well, you see, the church age was totally unknown to all biblical writers except the Apostle Paul. Now, people don't like that, and I say it carefully, but it's a fact. That's why Paul is always saying, Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret. Well, who kept it secret? God did. And you all know Deuteronomy 29, 29 by now. The secret things belong unto the God, unto the Lord our God, and those things which are revealed belong unto us. What's the word revealed mean? Something that's been kept secret has now been revealed. All right, so the church is still a secret. All through these Old Testament prophets, you don't see any sign of it whatsoever. This is the format. Now, you've got Psalms chapter 2. We've used it thousands of times, I think, in the last years. But here it is again. Down to verse 4. When mankind, Jew and Gentile, Romans and Israel, have rejected the Messiah, they've crucified him. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, a laugh of derision. Then, verse 5, after they've rejected him, then he shall speak unto them, that is, the human race, but Israel in particular, because they are the most responsible. Then he'll speak unto them in his what? Wrath. And he will vex them in his sore displeasure. But what's going to follow? 
the king. See, the king and the kingdom. That part of scripture, like I say all the time, most of Christendom knows nothing of. That after Christ has been crucified, rejected, ascended back to glory, he's going to wait whatever time he knows it's going to take until the tribulation has ended and he returns and sets up his kingdom. All right, now then, stop at Daniel chapter 12 once again, because if you're like me, you've already forgotten what we talked about two minutes ago. <laughs> Daniel 12, verse 1. The last half of the verse, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, that is from 2000 B.C. when Abraham was called, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, those that are found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, the believing element. All right, now jump up to Matthew 24 and see how perfectly Daniel agrees with what the Lord Jesus himself says. Matthew 24, and we'll just start at verse 15. And again, verses that we use over and over. 24, 15. And remember, this whole chapter of Matthew 24 is Jesus unveiling the horrors of these final seven years. Starting up front with verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Well, we're already seeing the beginning of those kinds of deception with all the false teaching that is rolling upon the human race. But all right, jump up to verse 15 to get the parallel, if I may use the word, the parallel with Daniel 12, verse 2. <clears throat> Now the Lord himself says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that is the Antichrist going in and defiling the temple, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him read. Then let them who be in Judea flee because of the coming holocaust. But the part I want you to compare with Daniel is verse 21. For then... When we get to these final three and a half years, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, that is at zero <laughs> or in the first century, 29 AD, however you want to put it, nor ever shall be looking all the way down the quarters of time to the end, there would be nothing to compare with these final three and a half years. Now, what makes me have a heart stop is when I read this and then think of Hitler's Holocaust. See, that was down the pipe 1900 and some years from the time that Jesus spoke this. But even that will pale into insignificance compared to these three and a half years. You and I cannot comprehend it. And yet we can't diminish it because it's what the book teaches. All right, so now then coming back to Daniel chapter 12, it will be a time like there has never been before. Except for those who had become believers and uh, or will in God's own uh, knowledge, his pre-knowledge, foreknowledge. All right, but now verse 2. Now we dump into something that Daniel probably deals with more specifically in this last chapter of his prophecy than all the Old Testament put together. Because, see, you don't have a lot of reference to the resurrection in the Old Testament. Now there's enough that we knew that they believed it. They understood that there was an afterlife. But to understand resurrections, as we can see now from chapter 12, and then jumping into the New Testament, the Jews just didn't have a handle on it. All right, but verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust, in other words, that have died physically. Now, maybe I better qualify. Why does the scripture speak of the physical death as sleep? Now I'm going to make you aware of some of the cults that speak of soul sleep. No, we don't believe in soul sleep. The soul never sleeps. 
it never loses its consciousness because the soul was created after God himself and God doesn't sleep. So get those two concepts separate. The soul never dies. The soul and spirit never sleeps. But the body that dies does. It sleeps. Why? Because the day is coming, God's going to awaken it. So it's not gone like a dog. It's again that intrinsic created being of God in such a way that he can call it back to life. So it's correct to call physical death sleep, but don't ever speak of the soul sleep. Now, did I make my point? Did I make it clear? The soul never dies. The physical body does. And we can call it a sleep because it's going to be awakened again. See, it's not final. All right. So many of them who sleep in the dust of the earth. In other words, they've died physically all the way since Adam. See? And what's going to happen to them? They're going to be awakened. See, that's the whole teaching of resurrection. Now, most of the religions of the world all your oriental religion, all that, they don't speak of resurrection. They speak of attaining a higher level of coming back in reincarnation. But to be resurrected, not a one that I know of has any dealing with that. Only our biblical concept. All right, now let's read on. So many of them who have died physically will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contempt. And they that shall be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn many righteous as stars forever. All right, now let's jump all the way up to John's gospel and see in the words of the Lord Jesus himself that very same concept. John's gospel, chapter 5. Now this is the, the beauty of Scripture. The more you study it, the more you compare Scripture with Scripture, the more parallels that you can draw, the more believable it comes. And the scoffer can scoff all he wants. And you know why he scoffs? They never read it. They never read it. They scoff about something they know nothing of. You know, I think I shared it on one of the previous programs. I don't, much, I don't watch much television, but I happen to catch when Bill O'Reilly on Fox was interviewing Ted Turner. And, of course, you all know Ted Turner has CNN. So Bill was kind of jabbing him a little bit, and he said, Ted, if I understand you correctly, he says, you hate Fox News. He says, I sure do. He says, well, how can you hate something that you never watch? <laughs> because you never watch Fox, do you? He says, never. Well, then how do you know what you're hating? Well, you know, it's the same way with Scripture. If they've never studied it, how can they hate it? If they've never studied it, how can they scornfully scoff at it? It really becomes ridiculous, doesn't it? But all right, now look what the Lord Jesus says and compare it with what Daniel wrote. That those who are asleep in the dust shall be awakened, some to glory and some to everlasting contempt. Now here's what Jesus said about it. Math, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. Well, now that's 2,000 years ago, but 2,000 years is nothing in God's eyes. So it's still out in front. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves, everybody from Adam to the end that has lived as a human being and died will hear his voice. Not all at once. Not in just one resurrection, but over the period of resurrections, they're all going to be brought forth. All right, now here he divides them. Verse 29, And they shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life. Now we've done this before. When the scripture speaks of human beings doing good in God's eyes, what have they done? They've believed. I heard it over here. They have been people of faith. From day one, it's faith that is the key. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
All right, so men of faith, whatever dispensation, they will come forth in the resurrection of life, but those who went out into eternity without faith are going to come unto what? The condemnation, the resurrection of condemnation. So here you have Daniel and John in his gospel in perfect accord that the day is coming when every human being will experience resurrection and some to life eternal and some to eternal doom. All right, come back to chapter 12 again for just a moment. We're on verse 3. And they that are wise, those who had the wherewithal to believe what God said, you know, that's the smartest thing a person can do, isn't it? <laughs> Is to become a child of God in whatever dispensation, whether it was Adam and Eve or whether it was someone since then or whether it's today or whether it's in life to come or in time to come. This is the smartest thing that a human being can do. All right, so if they're wise, they'll be as the brightness of the firmament. In other words, as they are in God's presence. And they that turn many to righteousness will be as the stars forever and ever. In other words, there's our encouragement to be a soul winner. All right, now then, verse 4. We'll shift gears here a little bit, and we'll come back to the resurrections later in the chapter. Now, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel. Now, remember, how old is he? Oh, he's up 90. He's almost pushing 90 or a little over. He's getting right up there, and he's never going to get back to the promised land in this life. But thou, o Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now, that sounds odd, doesn't it? But think about it. Was there any need in God's wisdom to be talking about prophecy 2,000 years ago? Of course not. God knew it wasn't going to happen, and so there was real, no real need to have an understanding of it. But you see, as I pointed out in the thing of the last taping, when you go back into the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah was prophesying and preaching and proclaiming to the nation of Israel of his day, 700 B.C., that the enemies were coming, and that if Israel did not turn from their wickedness, they would be hearing foreign languages in their midst. In other words, occupying troops. And over and over, he's warning Israel of the coming Babylonian invasion. And I think I said it in the last taping. My, it sounds it's going to be in another month or two, and they'll be here. How long was it? Remember? hundred years. It was a hundred years before it happened. But it happened. <laughs> and that's why I'm saying the same way here. We may think these things are way out in the future, but it's going to happen. All right, but now so far as understanding end-time prophecy, that God in his wisdom knew that from Daniel's day until these things would actually come to pass would be 2,700 years. Well, there was really no need for it. So how did God program it? Well, I'm still going to stick to that 100 years. And we've been doing it in our seminars from time to time. I have a series of three or four nights lessons, the signs of the times. When the Lord said in Matthew, you can discern the red sunset and know it's going to be fair tomorrow. In other words, you can understand the signs of the time, but you can't understand biblical signs. Well, we have the same thing today. See, now God has opened these prophetic books and since about 1860, 1865, there's been an increase in the knowledge of prophetic, un prophetic things. But it wasn't necessary until then. And so most of Christendom knew absolutely nothing of end time events. Now they did for the first few years after the temple was destroyed. But see, that faded off and these things were moot. But now, just stop and think. How many of the things that we see indicating that we're coming down to the end and now we're coming, I like to do it this way, like a snowball rolling downhill. So when I do this, that's what's in my mind. I just see that old snowball picking up snow as it's going along. All right, the further down it goes, the faster it goes, and the bigger it goes. 
This is what we've got with end time scenario, which these people back here and all the way up until about 1860, none of them knew anything whatsoever. Now, you've got to realize that most of your mainline denominations and all of Roman Catholics to this day are not taught anything of end time. Nothing. All you have to do is just talk to any of these end time denomination people. And I don't mind naming them because they'll admit it just as fast as I will. You take all of the mainline Reformation churches, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Christian Reforms, and uh, the Methodists, the Congregationalists, and probably others. Go up to any one of them and ask them about the rapture. Ask them about the tribulation. You know how they'll look at you? Like we old cow men say, like a bull at a new gate. <laughs> How am I going to handle this? They don't know a thing about it. Now, there are a few that are starting to wake up. But for the most part, they know nothing of end time prophecy because they're still keeping the book closed. All right, go to a Roman Catholic. I don't care who he is or she. Ask them. Do you know anything about the rapture? I had a fellow the other day. Had never heard the word. Had never even heard the word. Let alone know what it was. And that's typical, see, because they have never considered end time prophecy. And of course, primarily because one of the early church fathers, and I put this on a program several months back, Oregon, O-R-I-G-E-N, one of the early church fathers was the first one to promote replacement theology. And of course, the reason was Oregon, living after 100 A.D., around 135 A.D., he, of course, had witnessed the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the dispersion of the Jews. And the Jews were already all around the then known world. Well, he came to the conclusion that God was all through with the Jewish people and that in time they would assimilate and disappear. Now, that's why we call it replacement theology, because the church was supposedly picking up what Israel dropped. Well, it was one of the most awful, awful things to come out of the early church father, because this is the reason now then that all your mainline Protestant denominations coming out of Roman Catholicism in 1511 never heard it, never considered it until this very day. All right, but it's the same way with a lot of other things. God kept the lid on technology. Until when? Again, the late part of the 1800s. Then all of a sudden, you have all of your inventions, one after another. The steam engine, the telephone, the telegraph, electricity, of course. And then by the time you get to the turn of the century, you come to the airplane, the automobile. Now you're downhill. And now technology just starts rolling until we get past World War II, and now up into our own lifetime, the advent of the computers. My, I think I was sharing with one of my classes on the road the other day. Do you know how big a computer was back in 1970? It filled a room almost this size. Now he got it in a shirt pocket. <laughs> same power, same ability. And I happened to have a fellow in one of my audiences who had worked with computers in 1970. He said, Les, you're exactly right. He said, when I first started working in the computer business, it took a room almost as big as this one to do what our little handheld does now. Well, just imagine how technology in the secular world has been unrolling. And in the biblical area. See, now we have an understanding, we have resources that up until the turn of the century, they never had and they never used. And so all these things are just exactly as the scripture shows. See, now we didn't read the last half of verse 4, that close up the book, even to the end, and then there's a colon. And then the last half says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, I think most people always just think world's knowledge. No, biblical knowledge and understanding of the scriptures like has never been before. And it's because 
God has now opened the understanding that we can discern these things that folks a hundred years ago had no possibility of understanding. And so now in the two minutes we have left, I'm just going to pursue this a little further. As we are now seeing the signs of the times, this tremendous increase in biblical understanding, biblical outreach, as well as in the secular world of the inventions and the discoveries. Now, I read in a scientific journal about three, four years ago, and we're seeing the evidence of it already. You know what the big push in all of our research laboratories is? To make everything smaller. Smaller, smaller, smaller. And see, that's why we have now come from a computer that fills a huge room to a little outfit in our shirt pocket. And the same way with all these other things. The cell phone. My goodness, I know the first cell phone Iris and I had was a box that big that sat on the floor. But now here it is, so small, the kids just hold it all there, you know, and there again, they're texting. And I read another article. They're getting addicted to it. And how in the world can a kid learn anything if all he's doing is asking his friend, what are you doing? And the friend texts back, nothing. So then five minutes later, he texts his friend, what are you doing? And he texts back, nothing. But you see, the brain is sleeping. That's what worries me. These kids are going to find nothing in all this punching of their cell phone that's going to prepare them for the future. Oh, well, I'm getting on a soapbox. But anyway, (laughs) look at all the things that are snowballing just since 1900, the New Age movement. Now, you see the New Age movement except as the ancient religions, but to actually pick up tidbits from the New Age phenomena and put it into a modern scenario was unheard of until about the 1890s, a gal by the name of Alice Bailey. Then after 1900, others picked up her her thinking, and it's also been snowballing. And right now, the biggest push in our big churches in the cities are a movement as New Age as you can get, but are under the disguise of evangelicalism, and it's called the emerging church. Look out for it. It is as dangerous as anything can be. And what they're really trying to show is that they want to bring all of Christendom back under the umbrella of Roman Catholicism. That's what it really amounts to. And so we're hearing it in our travels that especially in these larger churches in the cities, these people are coming in with the doctrine of what they call the emerging church. And beloved, it's as dangerous as anything can be. Well, according to my clock, my time. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.